All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alex Taylor, as most of you probably know. No, not really. I was just. Uh, <laughs> um, like most programmers uh, who write free software, uh, I tend to write things that I myself uh, want or need personally. Um, and this has served me reasonably well, but uh, in a lot of cases, uh, I've discovered I don't have the time or the knowledge to be able to write everything that I want to. So for years, I've had an ever-expanding bucket list of things that I hope I can write someday. And I'm probably not unique in that either. But anyway, um, over the last uh, many years, I've been doing various things with my life, work and school and so on. But about 18 months ago, I finished up my long-delayed postgraduate studies. And since uh, finishing school there, I've had more time to devote to programming. And as a result, I've actually been dusting off some of the long-neglected items on my list. And I've actually managed to make real progress on a few of them. So I'll be talking about some of these software projects uh, and a few other things which I've been working on over the past year or so. Most of these are not official Arkanoa projects, by the way, although that doesn't mean some of them won't find their way into Arkanoa products. Uh, I hope some of them will. Hopefully, most of you can find at least one interesting thing uh, in what I'm going to talk about. Maybe more. Next, please. OK, here's some quick information about me and my background. Uh, as you can see, I've worn a number of different hats over the years. Um, but the bottom line is I've been developing OS2 software for almost 20 years. Has it really been that long? Yeah. What have I done with my life? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, exactly. Good answer. Shared it with you. So most of my, next slide, please. Uh, most of my public software is available uh, through one or both of my websites here. Um, my home page mostly contains older stuff. Most of my more recent open source projects are on Gip GitHub. Uh, there are some also that are on the uh, NetLabs uh, subversion system. But as I said, I generally write programs that I personally have a need for, or which catch my interest for some other reason. As a result, my software is a pretty oddball collection of stuff. However, you'll probably notice some themes that I tend to come back to a lot, including UI and UX design, software internationalization, localization, and text encoding, with a particular interest in Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, East Asian languages, or CJK as they're known, and of course, fonts, typography, and printing. Uh, next, please. So having said that, I'm going to start by talking about some recent work that I've done on other people's software. Next, please. Now, New View is Aaron Lawrence's excellent replacement OS2 help file viewer. The source code has been on NetLabs for years, but since it's written in Speedsoft Sybil, there aren't many people who have the tools or the knowledge necessary to work on it. The problem that I had with New View is that it was basically broken with respect to DBCS, i.e. East Asian text. Now, if we at Arca Noe ever want to release Chinese, Japanese, and Korean versions of Arca OS, this is a problem that needed to be fixed. I've had a ticket open on this for a while, but the thing is New View hasn't really been actively maintained in years. I know quite a bit about DBCS text processing, which is a fairly specialized topic. So I basically knew what was necessary to get New View to support it. The problem was that I didn't know Sybil or Object Pascal, which is the underlying language. For a while, I was hoping that some Sybil expert would show up, pick up the ticket, and I could help them with the necessary logic. Uh, eventually, though, I realized that the only way this problem was going to get fixed was if I learned how to modify and rebuild New View myself. So I checked out the Sybil code from SVN. Unfortunately, it wasn't in a state that was easy to work with. For one thing, the build instructions were vague and assumed that the developer was pretty much expert in Sybil already. And for another thing, it used hard-coded drive letters and paths. Uh, and it had some other nice little traps for the unwary. Yeah, there was this kind of circular logic thing where you had to have co the components library already built before you could actually build it. <laughs> so <laughs> and it, w it wasn't included in the repo, so I, I had to add a pre-built version of it to the repo to, uh, to get that going. 
Um, but anyway, I spent the first considerable while just revamping the, the directory layout and the build logic. But this was worthwhile because once I was done, the code's actually in a shape where anybody with a copy of Sybil could pretty much check it out, follow my new simplified instructions, and do a build. And I tested this by getting somebody <coughs> who knows even less about Sybil than I did to try it. And they were able to build it with no problems. So I consider that the uh, kind of proof of concept. So once that was done, I gave myself a refresher course on Pascal and managed to pick through the internal logic uh, of NewView well enough to implement the DBCS support. Once this was built and tested, I got permission from Ronald Brill, who is still technically the maintainer of record, to release it as NewView 2.19.5. As luck would have it, a couple of small regressions were found soon after that. So I have an updated 2.19.6 ready to release once it finishes its testing cycle. And hopefully, that will be before the end of this month. Now, my original plan was to do some demonstrations of these programs as I went through the, the uh, presentation. Unfortunately, that, would requ that will require moving my laptop over there and hooking it up to the projector directly. So I've decided I'm going to do all of the demonstrations together at the end of this talk. So um, if you're thinking, hey, show us these programs you're talking about, we'll, we'll get to that. All right, the next one, um, I, at around the same time, I took a look at updating another of Aaron's civil programs, uh, config apps. Uh, if you remember, some of you probably do, this is the original configure internet applications GUI that allows people to easily set OS2's default web browser, email program, and so on. Now, up until now, the source code for this has basically just been stuck in a zip file on Hobbs. However, I found that it actually uses some of the same custom libraries as NewView. I mean, Aaron wrote them both, so um, that's logical. Uh, so I thought it best to simply add its source code to the NewView repository, which makes it much easier to build and maintain. So now that's been done, and the source code is in the uh, NewView repository on NetLabs. As for my updates, uh, besides some minor cosmetic tweaks, like better keyboard accelerators, uh, I added multilingual support to the program. I did this by using the same language support modules that Aaron designed and used in both NewView and his editor, AE. So now it's possible to have fully translated versions of config apps simply by providing text-based message files in the same way as NewView. And uh, this, this has been done and ready for a while. Uh, version 1.2 uh, is just about ready to release. I, the only thing is I want to update the icon because the current one is not very nice. Um, so hopefully, I'll have that out soon publicly as well. Question, yes? Um, how do you switch languages? Are you using the language environment variable, or are you using the locale? Um, language environment variable. It's, it's the same system it's that AE and NewView use. So they'll pick up the lang environment variable. Okay. Um, I think you can override it, but uh, I haven't gone into a great, I, 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 I just basically use the stock logic. I didn't try to add any fancy options to it. All right, next slide, please. Um, something else that I've been doing is learning to build software RPM packages. And uh, I started out by just packaging up some pre-built software like rsync on the old term cap library and the OS2 TETEC distribution of LaTeX. So uh, these are all packaged up, uh, available as RPM. Well, they're built, and they're ready to be made available. At the moment, they're not in any repository, I believe. But uh, I understand that there will soon be a community-hosted RPM repository where packages like this can be distributed. And hopefully, that will be uh, coming soon. Because <coughs> the thing is, they're not official NetLabs ports, so they don't really go in the NetLabs repo, and they're not official Arcanoa products, so they don't go in the Arcanoa repo. So we need this kind of community repo where stuff like this can go. And I believe, I have been assured that it's coming soon. Uh, anyway, next I moved up to actually porting software and building it directly as RPMs, which is kind of how you're supposed to do it. And the first major project that I did this way was to port a suite of software called FreeWNN to OS2. A free WNN is an input method editor engine for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. For anyone who isn't familiar with the concept of IMEs, basically uh, all of these languages have thousands of different characters in their writing systems 
which is far too many to fit on a keyboard. The only effective way to type in one of these languages is to use an IME, which is a special software conversion layer that lets you type using a simplified phonetic system, uh, and that converts it into the proper characters as you type. Now, DBCS versions of OS2 include their own IME, obviously, uh, but they're old and not all that good, and they can't be used on an English OS2 system, which would be more useful to me. Anyway, in porting FreeWNN, I created core and development RPMs for Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. Uh, these will be made available, along with the source RPMs, through the same channels that I mentioned. <coughs> I should point out that FreeWNN itself is only a server and a set of libraries, which provide the IME engine. Without a front-end client that uses them for the user to actually type with, it's not very useful. As it stands, you can run the FreeWNN server on an OS2 system and have a client running on Linux, um, there are several available, uh, that points to it. Of course, an actual OS2 client would be better, but, well, more on that in a few minutes. Uh, next, please. Now let's move to my original software. As I said before, I tend to write programs that I need. As you may know, I lived in Japan for most of the past decade. And of course, I study the language. I'm not great at reading or writing it, but sometimes I need to, to the extent that I am able. Next, please. Uh, I just talked a little about input method editors, or IMEs. Nowadays, most modern operating systems include IME software, which is available across all, languages, uh, all language versions. Unfortunately, not OS2. The Japanese DBCS version of OS2 has an IME, as do the Chinese and Korean versions, but none of them can run on any other version of OS2. So if you want to use them, you would have to run the DBCS version of that language of OS2. And trying to run a DBCS version of OS2, if you use other languages or keyboards especially, <laughs> is extremely awkward, to say the least. So for years, I've been frustrated at not having any effective way to type in Japanese on my English OS2 systems. My first attempt many years ago uh, at addressing this shortcoming was to write a very simple phonetic input tool. I called it Image, uh, that's short for IME in Rex for Japanese, because um, it's written in VX Rex. Uh, it was extremely limited. I had to do all my typing inside the Image project wi uh, program window then copy and paste the text into other applications w where I actually needed it, like PM Mail or OpenOffice or whatever. Also, it only supported purely phonetic text. No ideographic characters, none of those beautiful like Chinese-derived uh, characters that these languages mostly use, which means that I could only write at about the first grade elementary school level. <coughs> Next, please. <coughs> I beg your pardon? So after years of getting more and more frustrated by Emerge's shortcomings, last year I gave it a major overhaul. Emerge 2.0 fixes a number of limitations, like uh, adding the ability to, to include line breaks in the text. And uh, it has an easier and more efficient user interface, I think. I also added online help, undo support, and even a very crude version of ideographic character conversion, which you can sort of see if you squint demonstrated here. Um, and this is basically a dictionary lookup using the open source edict and kanji dict Japanese dictionaries. Um, what you would basically do is you type the, whatever you want to type phonetically, then you'd go back and actually manually highlight a word and then hit the conversion key, and it would do a dictionary lookup of that phonetic word and give you all of the matches for it. Um, unfortunately, it only works on dictionary words. It doesn't work on conjugated verbs or adjectives. It, doesn't, uh, it certainly doesn't do more than one word at a time, so you can't convert a whole sentence like a proper IME could do. Um, but it, yeah, like it's not a true IME. But at least I could kind of get work done this way. My dream, though, can we go to the next slide, please? 
my dream was always to have a proper input method editor that I could use on any version of OS2, like all other modern operating systems have. So I'll introduce my newest project, WNNIM for OS2. And I, uh, next, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Using a program like Emerge is a very poor second choice compared to a proper IME. So I can't type, just recapping some of its limitations, I can't type Japanese directly into any arbitrary application. I have to type into the Emerge window and then paste the text to where I want it. And while Emerge 2.0 has kind of half-baked kanji ideographic support, it's extremely limited. So only unconjugated dictionary words or individual characters are supported. No more than one word can be converted at a time. It doesn't convert as you type. You have to go back and select each word manually that you want to convert. Um, so yeah, I, we want a proper IME. And while, as I mentioned, there is an actual OS2 IME, it has its own set of issues. You can only run it on DBCS versions of OS2. In fact, you can only run it on the specific OS2 NLV that it's implemented for. So you can't, for example, type in Korean on the Japanese version of OS2. You're running on Japanese, you can only type in Japanese. You're running on Chinese, you can only type in Chinese. Um, and of course, it, it's old and not very sophisticated. IMEs on other platforms have pretty much passed it by. And sadly, uh, some applications don't support it very well, or at all in some cases. <coughs> OpenOffice, for example. So uh, the good news is that there are several mature, high-quality, open-source IME engines uh, out there. And the big three, uh, as I discovered when I went looking, are FreeWNN, Kana, and Anthe. Next slide, please. I looked at all three of those, and I ended up porting WNN for a few reasons. Uh, first, it's highly mature. Out of the three, I believe it has the longest history. Second, it has API documentation available, something that Anthe, for one, is sorely lacking. Okay, all the, almost all of the documentation is in Japanese, but at least it's a start. Um, and next, there are versions of FreeWNN that support Japanese, Korean, and both written forms of Chinese. And perhaps most relevant, out of the three, uh, FreeWNN was the one that I actually managed to compile and get running on OS2. <laughs> I did try building all three of them. VWNN uh, was the one that worked, so it, uh, it won, yeah. <laughs> so as I described earlier, I built the RPMs for this last year. And after that, I spent some time writing simple test programs to learn how the API works. And finally, March of this year, I began writing a native OS2 presentation manager front end. A very early preview release is up on my GitHub site. Now that build is pretty limited, and it only supports phonetic conversion. But since then, I've gotten ideographic, that is kanji, conversion working, and I can demonstrate that for you in a bit. There are still a few rough bits to sort out, but hopefully I'll have a new pre-release build up on GitHub fairly soon. And you can see a little screenshot of it there, if you can make anything of that, which you probably can't at this resolution. <laughs> Next slide, please. OK. Now, for years, I've been frustrated by the lack of what I consider a decent, simple desktop calculator for OS2 that suits my purposes. I know there are lots of different calculator programs out there, uh, but I just don't like any of them. Most of them are highly specialized or designed with a particular type of use in mind, like, for example, accounting calculators or statistics calculators. Uh, or in some cases, they just have weird problems or don't work very well. I just want a simple, standard, mathematical desktop calculator. I've actually resorted for years to using WinOS2 Calc for, because I could not find anything that I, else that I thought was even as good as that. Um, so, for years, I've been meaning to write my own calculator program. Somehow, I ended up writing two. <clears throat> I actually started working on a simple PM calculator app called Useful Calculator. Um, I'm not very imaginative when it comes to names sometimes, you'll probably notice. Um, a few years ago, I did that. Uh, I started work on it. 
I got as far as designing the GUI, um, but I'd never written a proper mathematical calculator before, and I wasn't quite sure how to do certain things. Uh, and so the project kind of ended up sitting on a shelf gathering dust while I prioritized other things. Then, about a year ago, uh, around the time that I was learning to use Qt, uh, I was going through the Qt4 toolkit, and I noticed that it includes a sample calculator app. Uh, it's pretty crude, but it was a useful demonstration of how to do the things that I'd been wondering about. And I'd recently been getting annoyed once again at the lack of an OS2 calculator that I liked. So I thought to myself, why don't I rewrite this into something genuinely useful? So I started with that sample Qt calculator app and began modifying and expanding it. This eventually became AT Calculator. Again, really imaginative names we've got here. Um, my initials, AT. Um, so anyway, just as I was polishing AT Calculator off, I remembered my old useful calculator app. And I started thinking, you know, a lot of that was written already. Um, now that I know how to implement the missing functionality, I bet I could get it working in just a couple of days. And I was right. <laughs> so um, now I have two calculator programs almost for the price of one. Um, they're written in different languages and toolkits, but they have that certain shared heritage. And I figure they're both useful for various purposes. Um, useful calculator is pure presentation manager with absolutely no dependencies other than what comes with OS2. I've confirmed that it runs just fine on warp 3. Uh, it might even work on 2.1, but I have no way of testing that. Uh, as a result, it's extremely lightweight, and it runs lightning fast, even on older systems. AT Calculator has a few more features, like a hexadecimal input mode and a couple of additional functions. Plus, it's freely resizable um, dynamically. The buttons and everything scale with it. And you can change the font to anything you like, which might make it handy for very high resolution displays uh, or even for touch screens. That said, they both have similar functionality. They have a basic, although not huge, assortment of arithmetic, algebraic, and programmer functions. And very importantly to me, they both observe the proper mathematical order of operations, which is something a lot of simple calculator apps don't do. I, I had kind of a debate with Lewis about this. He was like, but that's how, that's how accounting calculators work. And I was like, that's great, but I'm not trying to write an accounting calculator. I'm trying to write a mathematical calculator. If you want an accounting calculator, there are accounting calculators out there that I'm sure would probably be better suited to that purpose. But yeah, so mathematical order of operations uh, observed. Are they perfect? Probably not, but they do what I need them to. Next slide, please. Uh, the next item is a project with a long history behind it. Uh, next, please. So as you know, IBM introduced the logical volume manager starting with OS2 warp server for eBusiness. Uh, they provided two different user interfaces for managing disks with LVM, the text mode LVM.exe and the graphical LVM GUI. Both of these programs had serious shortcomings, up to and including major design problems, although they managed to be terrible in different ways. At any rate, many OS2 users found them confusing and hard to use. This became a bigger issue once the convenience packages and ecom station came out, because obviously they used LVM as well and were more targeted at end users. So to address this, uh, way back then, I started what I called the LVM Redesign Project. I published several critiques and proposals, most of which you can still find on my website. Um, now, one thing IBM did right was to release the LVM source code, or at least the user level components of it, as open source. So the first phase of the design project, the redesign project, was to put together proper documentation and a usable developer's toolkit, which would make it possible to write new front ends for LVM. The second phase was to write a simplified GUI for LVM that was geared specifically towards doing what was necessary to get the operating system installed. And you've all seen that, because it was originally written, um, I think, around 2004. It was in ECS. It's in Arca OS too, as well. And um, it's been steadily, incrementally improved since then. Possibly grown a little beyond what I really wanted it to be, but oh, whatever. But at any rate. Way back then, I proposed the third phase, which was 
to replace the horrible LVM GUI with a much better user interface to the full LVM functionality. What's wrong with it? <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> Simulator. Um, I didn't have the necessary programming skills at that time, which was around 2003, um, but I sketched out detailed design proposals um, which, in the hope that somebody would adopt the project. Needless to say, that didn't happen. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, by around 2011 or so, I realized that nobody else was going to take on the project, so I decided uh, I was then at a point where I could try to do it myself. I wrote the basic framework of the program and got it semi-functional in read-only mode, but then life sort of intervened. I moved. Uh, there was an earthquake. I moved again. Then I went into graduate school. Um, you know, life. Well, uh, a few months ago, I decided to dust it off and at least polish it up to the point where it could be shown to other people for testing and feedback. And uh, my notes say, do a brief demo. But as I said, I'm going to move that stuff to later. But at any rate, it's a native presentation manager application and not Java. And it's designed to show all information on one screen instead of splitting it into two awkwardly separated modes like LVM GUI does. I'm not going to go into great detail about it now, but it's available on my GitHub page. And I invite anyone who's interested to take a look. It is functional, although it's not 100% complete. And I don't promise it's bug free. So you might not want to use it on a, a system which doesn't have a backup <laughs> available. OK, next slide, please. Let's move on to one of my biggest projects of the past year and a bit. I do a lot of work in text editors. And I often have to deal with text in different encodings, different languages, even different alphabets. For years, I've been thinking I should write a good Unicode-aware text editor. But once again, the idea ended up sitting on my endless to-do list. Then uh, about a year and a half ago, I had to repair my trusty ThinkPad. And due to the parts I was able to get, I ended up with a much higher s resolution screen than I had before. This is 1920 by, uh, by 1200. Uh, which on a 15-inch screen makes text pretty tiny. At the same time, my eyes are starting to show their age, and I can't read tiny text as well as I used to. So I changed my editor fonts, of course, and my so on throughout OS2 um, to larger sizes. But then I had to face the fact that once you get up beyond a certain size, the bitmap fonts that come with OS2 are pretty ugly. And without anti-aliasing support, outline fonts look even worse. I finally said, enough of this. It's the 21st century. I should have anti-alias text in my editor. So I sat down and wrote QE. Next slide, please. My requirements were basic but specific. I want a simple text editor for editing text files that starts up quickly, is simple and uncluttered, but supports certain essential features for working with text. There are several OS2 editors that fit this description, but they mostly use the standard presentation manager MLE control and therefore inherit its weaknesses. The PM control, the MLE control, has not, as far as I know, been significantly updated since around 1992. Now, even more sophisticated OS2 text editors, uh, from EPM on up, uh, are almost all trapped in what I call the code page ghetto, meaning they're restricted to displaying text that's supported by the current code page, and that's it. And as I mentioned, not having anti-alias text is pretty shameful these days. Next slide, please. We live in a post-code page world, but many of OS2's basic tools don't reflect this. Again, it's the code page ghetto. In my work slash life, I have to deal with text files in languages and writing systems that can't be supported by a single code page. I have to switch from English to French, OK. German, OK. Japanese, not OK. Russian, not OK. Korean, Thai. Yeah, you get the idea. So I want a text editor that can handle all of these at the same time if necessary. The obvious answer to these requirements is to use Qt, which supports all of these and anti-alias text, too. However, I didn't like any of the existing Qt editors I could find. Like the calculators I talked about earlier, they all seem to be highly specialized or weirdly gimmicky. 
I really wanted something like the system editor, only suitable for 2019 and not 1990. QE, I think, does this. Deliberately, it looks a lot like E or AE, but it supports multiple text encodings, Unicode text display, arbitrarily large files, and anti-aliased fonts. Next, please. So QE is written in QT4, but I took the time to add some OS2 specific enhancements, which are only enabled when you build it for OS2, obviously. Uh, that's the other thing. You can, build OS2, uh, you can build QE not just for OS2, but also for Linux and Windows. And, and I have builds for both. But I mostly use it under OS2, because that's why I wrote it. At any rate, first I made sure that it uses the native file dialog, not that horrible QT file dialog. And by native, I mean the default PM file dialog, whatever that may be. If you have X file, you will get the X file dialog. If you have the file open container from ECO, that's what you get. I also added support for native OS2 help. And for both this and the file dialog support, I abstracted the necessary functions into a separate source file, which should be usable by other QT4 applications. I implemented support for several text encodings that are common under OS2, but not normally provided by QT. And I made sure that it's extended attribute aware. That is, it won't destroy the EAs of existing files. Uh, it also uses the OS2.codePage EA to remember a file's encoding if it's a non-default encoding. However, it won't add useless EAs to newly created files. Uh, QE also supports printing, um, but on OS2, only so far to CUPS printers. I have some ideas about how I might be able to support native printers, but that's kind of a longer term project. QE is optimized for working with plain text. It is not a programmer's editor, doesn't have any source code features, no syntax highlighting, no compiler integration, nothing that would get in the way of what it's designed to do or add unnecessary bloat. The watchword is simple. Simple, simple. By the way, QE uh, does not officially stand for anything. I chose the name to fit the AEEE -E -E naming tradition of simple OS2 editors. And I went with Q because QT, quick, quality, and quintessential all start with that. And they were all attributes I was aiming for. If it really needs a long-term name, I might go with quintessential editor, even if that's a bit of a tongue twister. All right, now, um, I'll, I think I'll go to my conclu conclusions before I do the demo. So can you go to the next slide, please? Um, this presentation has kind of wandered all over the map, but I'll briefly summarize what conclusions I can draw from my work. Um, so maybe now, next please, maybe now we have a few better tools for dealing with different languages and text formats. Simple system type utilities can be just as valuable as fancy applications. And this is something that I found throughout my programming uh, career. Uh, you know, I started programming for OS2 just doing little simple things, not trying to write fancy, flashy, kind of um, marquee advertising copy type of uh, applications. And I think, in many ways, these are the most useful type. Uh, and finally, as I definitely found when writing AT Calculator and QE, uh, QT makes it incredibly easy to write very powerful applications. And I can't really stress enough just how useful it is to have this uh, toolkit available to us. So if you haven't yet, please consider donating to the QT5 project, because that really is uh, so much of a, uh, of a guarantee of our future on this platform. OK, so now I'm going to try and see if I can get some demos going. Unfortunately, this um, is going to go just straight from the projector to the screen. So people watching the stream probably won't be able to make out much detail, but we'll see. OK, so um, I'll start with the calculator. Don't need that. Um, so here's useful calculator. And of course, it's somewhere off the screen, isn't it? Uh, there we go. OK, uh, I, it should not be, it should not have all of this empty space here. I think that's because 
the uh, I'm not sure why that happened. That doesn't well anyway. Um, demo it's demo effect exactly. So anyway, um, it's very simple. The it's got a couple of appearance options. You can use small text or large text, but that you can't actually change the font otherwise. Um, it's deliberately laid out in a normal cal calculator type uh, of method. You've got memory keys, clear, clear entry backspace, a small set of uh, algebraic functions, and a set of fairly common uh, programmer-oriented functions. When you enter numbers here, um, it's decimal input. You can have up to, I think, 14 digits. and it will always display the hexadecimal version of the integer portion of whatever you have into here, which is useful for programming, I find. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's basically it. You can set it to be always on top as well, which that was a request I got. Um, yay. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's handy under some circumstances. You can copy the current value to the clipboard. You can paste, the you can paste uh, a numeric value that's in the clipboard into here. It, it only supports one clipboard, unfortunately, but I mean, there's apps you can use to manage that. Exactly. And yeah, that's basically it. AT calculator is, whoa, uh, slightly different in layout, but the functionality is quite similar. As you can see, it's got a couple of, a couple of additional functions, like uh, trigonometric uh, functions. And the other major difference is that you can change the input mode so that it's actually you can actually enter uh, uh, hexadecimal numbers, in which case the decimal value will be shown underneath. And if you're in decimal input mode, the hexadecimal uh, value will be shown underneath. Somebody asked me why I don't have an octal input mode. But uh, I mean, th th my personal experience is I've been a programmer for 20 years. I don't think I've ever had a reason to use octal for anything except calculating the ch mod values under Unix. <laughs> so like, other, maybe other people have a legitimate use for it. But primarily, I wrote this calculator for what I need, and I just didn't see a need for it. So yeah. Now, under, I've built this one for other, pl other OSs as well. For some reason, the, the always on top feature doesn't work under OS2. I think QT, our QT port just didn't implement that feature. So it's, it's, been, it's hidden from the menus on the OS2 port. But other than that, um, both of these are available on my GitHub site. There are um, builds available uh, for multiple platforms in the case of AT Calculator, or just for OS2 in the case of Useful Calculator. OK, um, I'm going to speed things up because I don't have too much time left. Uh, LVM PM, I mean, this is what it looks like, if I can get it onto the screen here. Um, there's not much that can be said about it. I can, I can hide non-LVM managed volumes, in which case it becomes a bit simpler. Uh, yeah, again, I'm not going to go into detail about this. You can find it on GitHub if you want to. Um, Config apps, I mean, what can I say? It's a basically a simple program. Th this is the modified version 1.2 that I, that I updated. Now, I'll show you what happens if I change the, uh, the language environment variable to, let's say, uh, let's say Spanish. There we go in Spanish. Um, oh yeah, the change I made to new view, I can quickly demonstrate. So yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is what this is new view 2.19.4 before I got my hands on it. So, so the problem with uh, this Japanese text is it doesn't wrap. It's, it only wraps when it encounters an English word. Because it doesn't realize because it only wraps on spaces by default, and Japanese text doesn't include spaces except in, when it uses English. So there's a scroll bar, but the scroll bar doesn't even go as far as the text. So it's actually impossible to see all of the text. But there are commas in the text. These are not English commas, though. These are ideographic commas. Oh, and yeah, if you try to ca highlight and do th the weird stuff happens because it has no idea where the character boundaries are. And the same with trying to click on the link. Like, uh, 
The, the clicking area is not working over there. In fact, it's somewhere off over here, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really quite messed up. So newview 2.19.6, uh, I fixed all that. This is the same help file, same help panel, uh, this one. And now it works. It wraps. And you can click on the link properly. And text highlighting works. Keyboard navigation <laughs> works. So it all works, so far as I've discovered. <laughs> yeah. And so what, what's next? Oh, yes. Uh, emerge. This is basically very simple Japanese input conversion. Now, if I type the sample sentence, anybody who's taken the international Japanese language proficiency test knows this sentence. It's, OK, well, first of all, I'll disable that. Uh, this is how you type. So this is, tenki ga ii kara sampo shimashou. This is, the weather is nice, let's go for a walk. And <laughs> you can get a lot of girls that way. <laughs> <laughs> is that what I've been doing wrong? Um, so if I turn on input conversion and retype that, the exact same characters, um, well, not exactly. Now, this is purely phonetic language. Actual Japanese written text would have like ideographic characters in there too. If I want to change the word, for instance, the word tenki would usually be written in Chinese characters. So if I want to get that converted, I would have to select it manually and then hit the conversion key, which is space in this case. Oops, no, sorry. It's control K. I'm getting a bit confused here. No, shift space. I can't even remember my own shortcuts. So then, OK, it loads the dictionary and says, OK, these are the words that match the, the reading tenki. And I happen to know this first one is the one I want. So there we go. And then if I want to convert other words, like sampo, I'd have to do the same thing. N now, it doesn't work if these are conjugated verbs. It doesn't work if they're conjugated adjectives. And I'd have to do one word at a time. I have to select them manually. It's a, it's a real nuisance. So. I'll now show WNNIM. This is what I was talking about, the real input method editor. And to demonstrate this, what I will do is I will open a Japanese uh, code page. So I, I'm going to run this app under the Japanese code page 932 and load AE here. And again, with nothing active, notice it's set to no conversion. That means conversion is not active. So if I type, well, no, I'll use the same sentence. Fair enough. No conversion. It's the same as usual. Now let's switch on conversion. Uh, so there's two conversion modes. Input conversion, which simply changes it to phonetic characters again. Now notice I'm typing into just an arbitrary application here. This is, not, this is just an editor window. It's not part of my program. So it will pick it up in any presentation manager application that s supports proper OS2 WM char message processing. OK, so now I've got phonetic input working. What if I want ideographic input? Well, I can actually arrange this to happen as I type. So this button turns on what's called clause conversion. Now I'll try typing into this application the exact same string of characters. Tenki ga i kara sampo shimashou. Tenki ga i kara sampo shimashou. Notice that it's appearing kind of underlined in a little box. That shows that it's a temporary input. It's actually a separate window that's overlaid at the cursor position over the application. So now if I hit space, it will attempt to convert the whole sentence. Boom and hit Enter to accept. Or if I want to change, well, I'll accept this one and then show you another example. So it's just inserted it in, full conversion, nothing more, nothing more needed. I'll try a different sentence. Yes, my name is Nakano. So I'll do the conversion again here, boom. So this is what that sentence would properly look like. But let's say I, I see, oh, the, the writing of the name Nakano is wrong. I want to write it in a different 
character set. So I can actually select different sections of the sentence because one thing the conversion does is it breaks the sentence down grammatically into separate phrases. So I can select each phrase individually and then fine tune the conversion by cycling through possible candidates. So Nakanode, so these are different possible writings of that particular phrase. So this is how I want to write it. So I'll hit enter to accept that one. There we go. So this is very sophisticated and it's really nice that I can do this under an English language version of OS2. And in principle, I could, write, I could compile this for Chinese or Korean as well. Uh, I just haven't because I don't, quite, I don't know either of those languages, so I can't really verify that they'd be working properly. Now, some applications, unfortunately, don't support having that automatic positioning of the overlay window at the cursor position. Qt, unfortunately, doesn't. So what I did in this case was, this is my QE editor. What I did was I had it enlarge the text, blow it up to a large size, and then show it at the bottom of the screen. So and as you can see, I'm not running QE under code page 932. So it still inserts the text. It just inserts it in code page 932, which doesn't display in this code page, which is the code page 850. Now, if this was. Um, running under code page 932, you'd see the, the Japanese text. And in fact, what I could do, um, well, no, I won't try that because I'm running out of time. What I will do now that I'm in QE, uh, I'll just give you a brief demonstration. So my QE editor here, it's very simple. As you can see, it looks a lot like AE. It looks a lot like um, system editor. It's written in Qt, but it supports the standard file dialog. I'm using Arca OS, so we've got the default file open container here. If I was running bog standard OS2 with no enhancements, it would be the standard file dialog. And I can select, um, it gives a history of recently loaded files. This is the, actually the log file for the WNN backend. And I know that this is supposed to be encoded in a Japanese text encoding. It defaults to whatever the current system code page is because that's what most text editors do. But if I know the encoding of this file, and I do, I can select it from this list of encodings. And this is a Unix-ported Japanese application. So I happen to know that it uses EUCJP. So I'll select that, and I get this. Oh, OK, you've changed the text encoding this file. Do you want to refresh the file from disk using the new encoding? And you won't get this prompt if you've modified the file. This is only if the file is unmodified. But I say yes, and now the Japanese text displays properly. And you can do that with any language that's supported by Unicode, Korean, Chinese, Thai, Russian, anything. It, it all just displays as long as you have a font that works with these characters. And I'm using this one, which is a Unicode font that supports most alphabets. And yeah, you can get some very nice monospaced uh, true type fonts. Inconsolat is a good one. Uh, actually, uh, Droid Sans Mono is a good one. That comes with Arca OS. Uh, Source Code Pro is another one. But they're, notice how beautiful they look, because they're anti-aliased. Yeah, these don't support Japanese, so I just get the substitution glyphs. But this isn't, it's, it's so much nicer to be able to read this anti-alias text on uh, uh, a high resolution screen. So that's a quick demonstration of my software. If anybody has any questions, uh, quickly I suggest, because I think Lewis is waiting on the line. Um, now's the time. I'll unplug this. Well, actually, I'll, in case anybody has any, anybody quest, uh, have any questions? I did such a good job of explaining it all. Excellent. All right, well, thank you very much, and I hope you found something interesting.